So we are tonight talking about decisions. And, and I'm going to say this several times during the class. Oftentimes we think computers are smart. Computers aren't. Computers are stupid. Okay, and I actually have a slide that says computers are stupid. When you think about a computer and you're thinking about trying to ask that computer to make a decision, think about a light switch. There's only two answers, on and off, or in the case of a computer, true and false. So we want to keep that in mind as we walk through tonight's lecture and as you start figuring out how to ask the computer a question or how to give the computer a question and have them give you an answer that is actionable. So a little bit of background. This is our first foray into writing algorithms. An algorithm is just <clears throat> a set of lines of code that are used to figure out a computational problem. And a computational problem can be a lot of different things. That's like this huge, big bubble. So if you're thinking about what a computational problem is that you're going to face in this class, think about what you have to turn in on week seven, which is your project. What we are doing this week and for every other week is building on the information you will need to get that project done. So what are we doing? We're doing decision and branching, looping, module 5 is functions, module 6 is data structures. And all of those are absolutely necessary for your game. Module 7, we start to go into file processing, which is just data storage. And module 8 is object oriented. But 3, 4, 5, and 6, are the basis for your game. So if you have questions, ask them. And I will do my best to help. So we got some new keywords and some new concepts. So we have the keyword if. If is how you ask a question in Python. Every question you ask in Python starts with an if. Now you can have compound questions that have other keywords, but every time you ask a question in Python, it's going to start with the word if. Now there's this little order thing on the left, and that's because these keywords come in order. Okay, When you're dealing with a compound question, which is you've got more than one thing to ask, but all those things are related, then you're going to be able to ask follow-on questions. And those follow-on questions, because they are related, have LF. You will never have a line that begins with LF if you haven't already had an associated line that begins with if. If you're thinking about asking a new question, you have to start with if. And we'll get into what elif is, and we'll also get into what else is. Okay? Else basically says, I have all these related questions, and if nothing else matches, do, what, do the code that's here. Um, so those are three new keywords, and they're very important. And it's important to understand the order and how they relate to one another. And we'll be doing a lot more of that. So now we have some new relational operators. The operators that we've used up until now have been the equal sign, plus, minus, divide, those things. And that's good. But now we have something called relational operators. And relational operators are used specifically to help us make decisions. That's their entire purpose for being. Okay, and we have six. The first is a double equal sign. Now, you guys have heard me say last week, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That's why I use the word single equal sign, because the single equal sign and the double equal sign are two very different things. The single equal sign is used for an assignment. The double equal sign is used to ask a question. 
And the question it's asking is, are, are these two things equivalent? Are they the same? But it will never do assignment. Then we have not equal to, which says, are these two things not the same? We have less than, we have less than and equal, greater and greater than or equal. And they both ask similar questions. Are, are is one thing less than the other? Is one thing less than or equal to the other? Greater than, greater than or equal to the other. And we now have Boolean operators. So we're, we're loading a lot of stuff on this week. So we have and, or, and not. And Boolean operators basically allow you to make complex questions because the questions you're going to start asking Python are going to be ridiculously simple. We want to learn how to add all of these different questions up to ask a reasonable, meaningful question to us. So sometimes you're only ever going to ask simple questions. Sometimes you're going to need to ask much more compounded questions. And that's how you do that, with these Boolean operators. So you also have Boolean values. And there are only two, true and false. Remember when I said computers are stupid? This is why computers are stupid. When you ask Python a question, you are only going to ever get back one of two answers. You're, only, uh, you're either going to get back true or you're going to get back false. doesn't matter how complex the question is it will always come up to a single value of either true or false. There is no in-between, there's no fuzzy between true and false, it's just true and false. So what we have to do as programmers is we have to learn to structure our questions in a way that a true answer or a false answer is meaningful. So, scope. We don't talk about scope until a lot later in the class, but I feel like scope is important now. Scope dictates when the code is going to be available to execute. Up until now, every line of code you wrote would be executed in order. That's about to change this week. So we have to understand when a, co a line of code will be run because what branching does, what if, elif, and else does is say, assuming, you know, given that whatever my question is comes out as true, do these lines of code. But if my question comes out as false, don't. And that is scope. That, and so we have to learn the difference in the different type of scope. We have global scope. Everything we've done up till now is in the global scope. We now have local scope. This is code that is defined inside of a class, a function, a loop, or a branch. It won't automatically get executed unless there's a reason to. And we define the reason. So that's what scope is. That's why it looks like this little bullseye. The blue area is the global scope. And then the orange area is the local scope. So the global scope knows about the local scope, but it, and, and the local scope can get stuff from the global scope, but the global scope can't get stuff from the local scope. So it's an exclusionary relationship. So let's talk about syntax formatting and scope. What we have here is a very simple program, and it happens to be challenge 3.2.2. And I have age is int input, user age. Um, we've done that before. We've done that for two weeks. We know what that's doing. Now I have this new code, and it's if user underscore age is less than or 18, print 18 or less, else print over 18. That is an algorithm. I have two questions that I'm asking. Well, one question I'm asking, one question, one, one will be the default. So 
what I'm showing you here is what's in the global scope and what's in the local scope. So anything that's left justified in PyCharm, completely left justified, is going to be in the global scope. So the first line, which begins with user age, the second line, which begins with if, the fourth line, which begins with else, are all in the global scope. Those two print statements are in the local scope, and those two local scopes are different. Okay, the print 18 or less that is under the if statement is its own local scope. And the print over 18, which is under the else, is a completely different local scope. So I've gone from having everything in the global scope to now being able to have some things in the global scope and create these like mini little areas for the program to run. And those little areas for the program to run only run when it only run when a condition has hit a true state. Okay, so now we have our syntax. We have the word if, and if tells Python it's about to make a decision. That's what it does. Else tells Python that a decision has been made and everything else is false, so you're going to do what's here. Okay, then I have this statement. And this statement is the crux, the bulk of what we're doing, talking about tonight. And basically the statement reads, user age is less than 18. Now that doesn't sound like a question. That's because it's not. When I know when I was a kid in elementary, middle school, and even high school, I had to take two false tests. It would give you a statement and you would have to mark it true or false. That's exactly what this is. This is a true or false question. User age is less than 18. If that statement is true, then we're going to do the local scope under the if statement. If that statement is false, then we're going to do the print statement that's under else. So you can think of the statements associated with an if statement as a true false question on a test. And then we have the colon. The colon can be the bane of students' existence. It can be the bane of my existence some days if I'm typing too fast. The colon, oops, sorry about that. We're just going to go back here. The colon um, basically is the question mark, and it tells Python when that statement that you're trying to evaluate stops. Without that colon, Python won't get anything right, and you'll start getting weird errors in your code. And that colon has to be for everything. It's not just for the if, it's for elif and else statements. And when we go into next week, it's going to be, you're going to deal with it with looping. And when we get to functions, you're going to deal with it with functions. So the colon is very important and it can drive people crazy. So computers aren't smart, neither are computer programming languages. This is a very true statement. So computers are stupid. So when I ask a question, it says, am I young? And Python's like, yeah, huh? I don't understand what you're saying. And that's because we have not phrased that question in a way that is discrete and that Python can understand. And discrete basically means it's quantifiable. Okay. Am I young is not really quantifiable. If I'm talking to a 20-year-old and I'm 30, I'm not going to necessarily be young to the 20-year-old but I would be young to a 40-year-old. But Python doesn't know any of that. It has no clue 
we have to tell it and then we have to ask the question appropriately so Python can understand. Remember, computers are stupid. They make they they have only ever got two answers to a question, period. Unless you're dealing with maybe a Cray computer. But for computers that we're dealing with, there's two answers, true and false. So how can computers do all these great things? How do I have a program here, a couple programs running, where I can share over the internet a slide deck and some, some code with you guys? That's because computers do what they do very, 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 very fast. So because they can do it very, very fast, you can ask a lot of simple questions in a very, very short period of time which allows the computers to do what we want. Um, the next great breakthrough in computing will be pushing through this binary barrier. Binary means there's two, one and two. Um, and so we have this restriction that's been around since the advent of the first computers, which was way before IBM. We're talking back into the 18, 1800s, they had computational computers. They were just mechanical. So we've had this limitation for a long time. And I, now I digress. Sorry. So computers are stupid. There's only two answers. They just make everything really, really fast. So how do we learn to speak Python? One of the ways we learn to speak Python is to phrase everything as a true or false test. So if I say, am I young, Python says, huh? So how do I ask this question in Python? Well, here's how I ask it. I make it discrete. I give it boundaries that a computer can understand. So first, I'm going to have this test variable. Okay, and this test variable is going to be used in that if statement. And um, it's going to have to be defined and assigned before I write that word if. So I have this user age that now has some value because I've input a value into user age. And I want to know if the value that I've input that's being stored in the variable user age is less than or equal to the number 18. If, well, let's do it as a true false. User age is less than or equal to 18. True or false. Assuming that the answer is true, I then go into the local scope underneath that if statement and I do something. But it only happens when user age is less than or equal to 18 evaluates to true. Otherwise, I'm going to print over 18. That only happens when user age less than or equal to 18 um, evaluates to false. So that, that is how you read that and you really have to remember when you're asking a question to a programming language that what you are doing is you're writing a series of true false test statements. Okay, so then we're going to look at code in just a second. So flowchart as a visual tool. We did a little bit last week and we're going to do some pseudocode this week. But I just want you to see what an if statement looks like visually. So I have I have my code that I just had. This is the, the flow chart for it. And basically, I have user age equal in input. And then I have this diamond. This diamond is new. And you have to know what this diamond is because when you do the assignment this week, you're going to have to add a flow chart. And the flow chart is going to have to have a diamond for every decision you make. So in this case, I get my user age in, and then I'm going to ask my true-false question. So I'm going to say, user age is less than or equal, equal to 18, true or false. In the event that it's true, I print less than 18 or less. In the event that it's false, I print 
over 18. Now I've put this blue box around here. It's not something you should do in a normal flowchart. That's just to tell you what an else looks like. So in a flowchart, when you are when you're thinking about your code, and then you have to think about a flowchart, this is what an else looks like when you're doing the flowchart. Now, by the way, when you have to do your flowchart. There's lots of different ways you can do them. There is a Google tool called LucidChart. It is free and you can create all of the flowcharts you need and print them out or download them into a file, into an image. So if you are trying to figure out how to do your flowchart, look at LucidChart. It's completely free and it's a pretty good tool. So let's just follow this through for a second. So I'm Professor Lisa, I enter 21, so 21 is less than or equal to 18, that's a false, so I'm going to print over 18 and I'm done. So that's the path that you take. As, as far as Python knows, nothing else exists. When user age is less than or eight, equal to 18, evaluates to false, the whole true stuff goes away. Python doesn't see that anymore. So now what happens if I am inputting something else? I'm inputting 10. So user age is 10. 10 is less than or equal to 18. True or false? It's true. All that false stuff goes away. I'm going to print out 18 or less and I end the program. So that is how you visualize what is happening when you are branching. And you can see from that diamond on the if statement, you really are creating branches. So one more decision maker. Am I middle-aged? Well, this is again, Python doesn't know what middle age is. So I'm going to input my user age. I'm going to say user age is less than or equal to 18, true or false. And I'm going to print 18 or less. We've already seen that. Now I have this LIF statement. LIF says, Python, I'm going to ask another question based on my test variable, which in this case is user age. And I can only, I will only ever get to this line, assuming the true false test for the if statement, user age is less than or equal to 18, has evaluated to false. Only at that point will Python see the LIF statement and think, determine if it even needs to do anything with it. Because assuming user age is less than or equal to 18, evaluates to true, then it's never going to see the LIF. And we'll see this in just a second in PyCharm. And then there's the else statement, which we saw before. But for this else statement, both the statement after the if and the statement after the elif have to evaluate defaults. So one more flowchart, and I promise we'll get to code. So I'm starting. I have user input. And then I have my first diamond. We've seen this before. User age is less than or equal to 18. If that's true, then I, I'm done. I print and I'm done. Now I have a second question. I have L if user age is less than or equal to 50. If that evaluates to true, then I'm going to print in middle age and I'm going to end. Otherwise, if everything else is evaluated to false, then I'm going to print nope, you're old, and I'm going to be done. So let's go back to our little evaluations. I'm inputting 10. We already know what's going to happen. I'm going to evaluate to true. And I'm going to print over 18. And I'm, I'm done. So now let's put in another number. I'm going to put in 21. 21 less than or equal to 18. False. So now I have 21 less than or equal to 50. True. I'm going to print that I'm in middle age. And I'm done. Now I'm going to add 60. 
If user age is less than 18, false. If elif user age is less than or equal to 50, that's false. So I am going to say, nope, you're old. And I'm done. So that is how you see an elif statement. They have to be, sorry about that, they have to be related, okay? They all have to be using this same test variable, user age. Where am I? User age, everything but the elif has to be using user age. That's how they're related. So let's go out into PyCharm and look at 3.22. Actually, let's look at 3.22 plus. Yeah, that's the one with middle age. So, good, that's already set up to run. I'm going to make it bigger. Now, I mentioned a couple of things when I was talking about colons and tests and where things are visible. But I wanted to show you in PyCharm. Because up till now, every time we've hit um, a line of code, we've attempted to execute it. But we will notice now that there are certain lines of code that Python's just going to skip. Also, I wanted to say that sometimes I talk about left-hand side and right-hand side. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about what's on the left-hand side of the Boolean operator. As, to, as opposed to what is on the right-hand side. And literally, it's left and right. So the left-hand side is the variable user age, and the right-hand side is some number or potentially some other variable that has a value I need to test. So let's debug this. OK, so I am going to frames and variables. I am here on if user age is less than or equal to oh, console. I'm going to put 42. So my user age is set to 42. I see that up here in PyCharm. And I also can see this in my variables down here. So what Python's now doing is it is asking a series of true false questions. 42, which is what user age is now, is less than or equal to 18 true or false. That's false. So I'm now going to go down to the next statement. You'll notice it didn't hit line 11. It completely stepped over it. That's because line 11 is in a local scope that will not be executed because line 10 evaluated to false. So now I'm at my next true false test. And that true false test is the value of user age is less than or equal to 50, true or false. Well, the value of user age is 42. It is less than or equal to 50. So now this will evaluate to true. And I will print what's on line 13. I will print in middle age. And you'll notice that it stopped. The program stopped after that. The program stopped after that because there was nothing else to do. It is never going to actually step onto the else line because it is this evaluated to true. Also, let me make that a little more clear by doing this. Okay, I'm going to do this again. And this time I'm going to put in 12. So. User age is 12. I'm going to ask my true-false question. The value in user age, which is 12, is less than or equal to 18. That is true. So when I step over this line of code, I'm going to say print 18 or less. I'm simply going to step over this line of code, and all of a sudden I'm down at line 17. Python did not attempt to execute those four lines of code. And it didn't do it because this if statement, which begins this compound question, this is a compound question, begins this long compound question 
said the first one evaluated to true, so I won't do anything else. And then when it comes out of that, it's going to go to the next line in the global scope. The next line in the global scope is line 17. So it will always execute done. So now let me break some things. Let's start with my favorite friend, the colon. Now, if I remove a colon, I, I might actually miss that there's this little red squiggly line there. But if I try and run it, I get a syntax error, invalid syntax. <clears throat> and this is one of those times where Python might actually give you um, a decent error message that's close to where the error is happening. So I add that back in, and now I'm going to see what happens if I put spaces there. Nothing, which is good. Now I'm going to do something else. I am going to take this print statement on line 11, and I'm going to justify it. Now, what does that left justification do? By doing that, I have just attempted to change the scope of that line from the local scope to the global scope. This is where you can get logic errors. When it is not a syntax error, it could very well be a logic error, and those are harder to find. So if I'm looking at line 11, I'm seeing all these red squigglies, but I don't understand why. So if I run this, I'm going to get indentation error expected an indented block. Why is it expecting an indented block? It's expecting an indented block because the line before it is an if statement. The only thing in Python you can have after an if statement is an indented block. So by tabbing line 11, I've just taken it from the global scope and moved it in to the local scope. So that is something to be very aware of, that you have to have at least one line under in the local scope when you have, when you're evaluating with an if or an elif or an else state. So now let me show you one other thing. Print this is bad. Okay, so I have my line in the local scope. Now I've added this line and it's in the global scope. So if I look, I've got all my little red squigglies and everything's unhappy. And if I try and run it, I get a syntax error, invalid syntax here at the LF. Now, if I just look at line 13, I'm going to go crazy because there's nothing wrong with line 13. And this is one of the times where I have to look backwards and say, okay, what's happening at the line before it? What I cannot do in Python is I cannot have a conditional statement, an if statement, something in the local scope, something in the global scope, and then have a related question because elif is related to if. The only way that Python knows to relate them is to make sure that it goes from the if statement to the local scope to the elif statement to the local scope. So that is fine because these two lines are in the local scope. If I decide to move one of these to the global scope, things aren't going to work. So that's just another pitfall. So I think that's everything I wanted to talk about on this one. And I know we're going through a lot of things. And whoops, wrong one. I know we're going through a lot of information in a very short period of time. And I am going to take the time to go over um, the labs and some code that's similar to some of the things you'll have to be doing in a lab this week. So that was my middle age flow chart. Boolean operators. Okay, Boolean operators change things up in the game. 
So a Boolean operator basically allows you to take two true-false questions and butt them up against each other. And then it's going to take the output of each true-false and it's going to figure out how to find a single answer from that. Because remember, even if that, you know, even if I have if and I have 12 statements with and in between them, it's still only going to give me a single answer. So I, as a programmer, have to understand how to deal with adding up all of these statements. Because that's what happens. What Python's going to do is it's going to go out and it's going to say, okay, if num1 is equal to 10, it's going to evaluate that completely separately. Then it's going to evaluate num2 is the same as 2. It's going to evaluate that separately. So I've got these two competing answers that have to be turned into one. The way to do that is we use these Boolean operators. And the important thing to understand about Boolean operators is that ands and ors work differently. Okay? For an and, everything has to be true for the statement to be true. If there's even one false, the entire thing is false. Okay, doesn't matter how many ands you have. If any one of those statements that you're evaluating comes back as false, the whole thing is false. Or is completely the opposite. If you have two true-false statements in the same if, so it's a compound statement, only one of them has to be true for the entire statement to be true. And in fact, with an OR statement, Python's only going to evaluate it up to the very first true. Once it gets a true in an OR statement, it stops evaluating. It doesn't matter how long your compound question is. So that's the important thing to learn about Boolean operators. You can add things up. You can at, take all these true-false questions and you can add as many of them up as you want. Each of them is going to be evaluated individually by Python and each of them is going to get their own true or false rank. Once the true or false is done for all of the questions that you've asked in that compound statement, Python's going to give you a single answer based on what all those individual answers are. So if you're going into programming, it is very important to begin now to understand how to combine ands and ors to make compound statements because you're probably going to do a lot of it. What's the next slide? Okay. So... Here is an example of using AND. And I'm using this between example because you're probably going to have to do something like this in a lab. And what you will see is you will see problems and they say, is this between A or B, whatever A or B is. So between is an important concept to understand. Now what you'll see here is you'll see a bunch of if, elif, 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 elf statements. And by the way, you can have as many elif statements under an if as you want. There is pretty much no limit. So what I have here is I have a range. That's what I've defined in each one of the if or elif statements. And I want to see if a number is between that range. So the way this works is, I have two, let's just take this first if statement. If age is greater, and actually let me just do this in PyCharm. I think it will be just easier for me to show you in PyCharm. Where is between? Okay. So, and I didn't bother to do an input on this one. I just said five because it was just easier to run. So let's get between. Uh, configuration 
between one day I learned to spell. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I have this code, and I just want to see if five is um, it, what age five does in terms of schooling. So that's what this is. So if I'm five years old, what should I be doing? Should I be going to school or not going to school? And if I should be going to school, what kind of school should I go to? So when I look at these and evaluate them, I'm going to look at each of these discreetly. So let me debug the program, okay? So I'm here and I am on my first question. This is a question and this is a question and Python's going to answer those questions individually. So if I mouse over the operator, it will show you what the value is for that particular true-false test. So this test is age is greater than zero. That is true. And here I have age is less than four. That is false. Because this is an and statement, the entire thing evaluates to false because this guy was false. So that means Python's not even going to try on line six. So now it's going to line seven. And it's going to do the same again. It's going to say I have age, which is five. And is it greater than or equal to four? Well, yes, five is greater than or equal to four. Then it's going to go over and it's going to evaluate age is less than nine, true or false. That's true. So I've hit upon the statement that is going to come out to true. So if I mouse over the and, I will see true come up. So I know that line seven is now true. So age is greater than or equal to four and less than or, and less than nine. So what am I going to do? I'm going to step into the local scope of just that Ellis statement. I'm going to print elementary school and then I'm done. Nothing else has to be done because that evaluated to true. So let's talk a little bit more about between. Here you'll see I have greater than or equal to or less than, sorry, greater than or less than. And that's fine. But when I'm doing a true between, I also have to remember to include the number. So here I can't say greater than four. I have to say greater than or equal to. So I'm actually including the number four in the statement. So you'll see here my ending question is age less than nine. So my, be my beginning question here is age greater than or equal to nine. So I'm including nine. But so you'll, the pattern is you have a start place. You have whatever end place you need for that first set of evaluations. The next one, you're going to look at the previous last question and make sure that you're including whatever that last one. So the, the last question we're talking about here is age less than four. So for this, the next between evaluation is greater than or equal to four. So you're including four. Um, so that's basically what you do with between. So if you're, if you're asked if something is between, Come back and look at between.py. Okay. So I think there's nothing. Okay, yeah, that's all that was here. Um, yeah, so we're good. All right, complex questions. Um, so I'm doing this because it's uh, very similar to a lab you might have to do this week that's for counting change. So here I just have this number 223. 
and I want to find the number of hundreds and the number of tens in the number 223. So output plural if more than one, output singular if none or zero. So that means hundred or hundreds. Hundreds would be the plural. Ten or tens where tens would be the plural. And again, I'm just using 223 rather than doing input. So I want to know how many hundreds there are. And the way you do that in Python is the floor operator. We don't use the floor operator, and most languages don't. And by the way, this will not work correctly if you try and use a modular for those people who are going to go out and try and use modulars. Um, so you have to use the floor operator, which is the double, I think it's a backslash. I'm horrible with my slashes, sorry. So the first thing I do here is I go out and I say, how many hundreds do I have? Well, I have 223 floor 100 is going to give me 200. So it's going to give me 2. So then I'm going to say num is num minus 100 times 100. So I'm now going to have the number 23. And then I'm going to have tens equal num floor 10, which is going to give me another 2. So the if else stuff comes in when you're getting ready to print it out. So if hundreds is the same as zero, so it can be read as, read as hundreds is zero, then you would print no hundreds. Else if hundreds is greater than one, so hundreds is greater than one, true or false, then print number of hundreds is, and I print the number of hundreds. Otherwise, I print there aren't any hundreds. I think that should have been one. My bad. So, yeah, I just talked through all that. And we do the same thing for tens. So this is where the if statement comes in. So if you're counting your change, you have to do something like this, but considerably more because you have to do it for dollars, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. So here's the flow chart for that. And we have our number, and then I've got to set hundreds. I'm going to set the num. Um, I'm then going to set it to tens. I'm going to say if num hundreds is true, then I'll put no hundreds. If that is false, then I'm going to check if hundreds is greater than one. If that's true, it's going to print out what the number of hundreds is. If that's false, it's going to say output none one output one hundred. So that's how I do that. And then I after all those are evaluated and potentially run. Then I ask my next question. If tens is zero, I'm going to output no tens. Otherwise, I'm going to say if tens is greater than one, then I'm going to output number of tens is and then the number of tens. Otherwise, it's just going to say one ten and then it's going to evaluate and in this case it's going to end. So um, instead of following the numbers, what time is it? Yeah, instead of following the numbers, I think I'm just going to show you this in PyCharm. So what was this one? Sorry. Oops. Nope, wrong one. Okay. This was what? Floor. Okay, so let's just go look at floor.py. Okay, let me just get it, find it here, floor.py. And then we can take a look at what's going on. Okay. So on floor.py, I've got money is 150, and I've got hundreds is 
one hundred and quarter is twenty five and those are just oh excuse me so I'm not type, typing 125 all over the place. And if I decide I want to change them, I can. So I have dollars equal money floor 100. And then I'm going to print dollars. And I'm just doing all these little pr print statements here so it's easier to find. So let's debug and take a look at what's going on. So frames and variables, I'm at the first line. So... I'm going to now set up my money as 150 and have hundreds and quarters. I'm going to say dollar is money floor 100. So I now have dollars is one and that's correct because there's only one 100 in 150. And now I'm going to say amount is money minus dollars times 100. So I have my new amount. So I have gotten rid of all the hundreds and I can actually go out and calculate the rest. So my money is now going to be 50 and I'm going to just determine the number of quarters. So I'm going to say amount floor quarter or 25. And so I have two. I'm going to print quarter. So now there's the if statement. And I could do this a couple ways, but I'm going to say if dollars is greater than zero, so dollars is greater than zero. That's a true statement. I can see it right there. I'm going to say dollars comma end equal, uh, sorry, dama co sorry, dollars comma end equal quote space quote means that I'm going to print it out, but I'm not going to end with a new line. I'm going to end with a space. Because then I want to see if I'm going to follow it by the name dollar or dollars. So if dollars is one, then I'm going to print out dollar. Otherwise, I'm going to print out dollars. So I have, I'm only going to print out one dollar. It's never going to go to the else. Now I do the same thing for quarters. If quarters is greater than zero, because I only want to print this stuff out if I have some quarters. I'm going to print quarters, comma, end, which is going to be two because there were two quarters. And it's going to say if quarters is one, I'm only going to print quarter. Otherwise, in any other condition, I'm going to print quarters. So this is how you work with that lab. And it's important that you understand a couple of things. First of all, let me make this bigger. And I didn't say this before explicitly, and I should have. You can nest if statements many times as you want. So you can have an if statement. It's an outer if statement like this, like line 15. Everything from line 16 through line 20 is in the local scope of the, line, the if statement created by uh, created on line 15. However, there's also a different two different local scopes within this local scope. So on line 17, I have another if statement. Line 18 is the local scope for that if statement, and line 20 is the local scope for the else on line 19. So I have all of this is in the local scope for line 15. But there's a further local scope on line 18 and on line 20. So it's important to remember, and that's where you have to start thinking about scope and what's available where. So let us go over the labs. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, this just is different ways through the flowchart so we can see it. All right. So lab 3.11. And this deals with um, equality and relational operators. Let me go find that. Oh, I don't have it up. I'll do it another time. Sorry about that. Um, and I also have the pseudocode for this stuff, which is in the next one. 
So pseudocode is another thing we have to do this week. Now, um, under Learning Module 3, there is a guide to pseudocode. And basically what pseudocode is, is it, it's a way of writing code that is not tied to a language, which seems kind of weird because you usually want your code to be tied to a computer programming language. But from a design perspective, it's good to work out the logic before you get into the nuance of a language. Because pseudocode, you should be able to take it and implement it in Python or implement it in C or implement it in Java. It just is a, a detailed design of what you want the algorithm to look like. So what we have here on this slide and what we will see for the rest of the class when we evaluate labs is that um, we, we're using different terminology. It's similar to, to flowcharts, but it's definitely not Python. You'll see the keyword set, which is an indication in um, pseudocode that you are assigning a value to a variable. Um, you have down here the if statement. So I have if, if, if first is less than or equal to second and first is less than or equal to third, then output first. So this is we're just trying to find the smallest. And then else if second is less than or equal. So what you will see here is I didn't use elif, I used else if. So those are some of the things for PyCharm sorry, for pseudocode that's different than Python. Um, that said, the logic would be the same. Are there specific lists of keywords for the pseudocode? No, not really. Um, uh, the the uh, information that the, the, la the school has on pseudocode does have some keywords that you should use. However, there are no standard keywords for pseudocode anywhere. So um, what I do for my class is I prefer that they use the pseudocode that is available in um, the information on Module 3. If there is not a specific pseudocode like set or input, um, for what you need, then it's okay to use another word that's descriptive. I don't take off points for that because there is no dictionary of pseudocode anywhere that I've ever seen. Um, what's it, what is important is that you're being language agnostic in your pseudocode. And this is language agnostic. So if I look at this, make it bigger. Um, you'll see that I am setting three variables. So these variables will be set by Python when you run it. And then I have two compound questions. The first compound question is basically first is less than or equal to second. That right there is your first question of the bigger compound question for the if statement. The second question is first is less than or equal to third. So both of these, because there's an and right there, both of these have to evaluate to true for you to print out first. If either of those two true-false statements evaluates to false, then you, you don't do what's under in the local scope of the if statement, you're going to fall down to the LF statement. You've got two questions in the LF statement. Second is less than or equal to first, true or false. Second is less than or equal to third, true or false. Because there is an and here, the first question and this second question both have to evaluate to true for the entire L if to evaluate to true. Should that evaluate to false, then you would go down and print out third. And here are some little bubbles to help you uh, know where to go look 
So we have the basic input, we have equality and relational operators because I have less than or equal to here. You're of course in your Python going to use the less than or equal to symbol. And then we have the link to the relational operators and then we also have multi-branch if-else statements. So that's 3.11. 3.12 is a big deal, okay? 3.12 is long and it really does require you to deal with very intricate if l if statements and it's a lot to ask. So what we're doing here is you're giving a month and a day and you have to find the season for that month and day. The way to do that is to evaluate every single um, you evaluate the month and the day given a set of parameters that are very specific in Zybooks because some months are split across the season. For instance, March. Um, if you get to the month is March and the day is greater than zero and the day is less than 19, you're still in winter. Otherwise, if the day is greater than 19 and less than 31, you're in spring. So this can get really complex really fast. So let's go over what it should look like. So I've got a month and a day. The first thing I'm going to do on every single one of my if, elif statements is I'm going to evaluate the month. Whoops. My bad. I won't do that again. Uh, where is it? Right here. I'm going to evaluate the month. And it's always good to keep things as similar a pattern as possible. So you will notice in all of these left justified else if and else if statements, I first start by looking at the month. And then I have a between, okay? Because this day for the month of January has to be between 0 and 31. It cannot be minus 1 and it cannot be 32. So I'm doing a compound statement here. The first is that month is January. The second is that the day that I've given is between the correct dates because if it's not then it's going to fall all the way down <laughs> over to here and it's going to say it's invalid. Then I have an elif, and the elif again begins with the month, and this month is going to be February, and I've got a zero, I've got my between, is the day less than zero, and the day less than or equal to 29. Sorry, it's greater than zero, and then less than or equal to 29. And don't, for this, don't worry about the fact that there are leap years. Just use 29. I'm going to output winter, then I get to March. March is... I'm going to look and make sure the day is greater than zero and less than 19, I'm in winter. If the day is greater than 19 and less than 31, I'm in spring. And if somebody puts some other weird number, like minus 42, I'm going to print invalid. You have to remember that if it falls through with all the other tests, then you have to print out invalid. And this is how I keep going for all of the months of the year. And the last thing you do, left justified, is the else and output invalid. Because if it didn't find anything here, if I put XYZ in for the month, I want it to fall all the way down to here, and I want to print invalid. So this is a tough one. Give yourself time. Start small. Even if Cybooks has a problem, or go do it in PyCharm. Start small. Take in a month and a day and start with, March, start with January and test January a bit. And then do February and test February a bit. And just keep building. Do not try and type all of this in at once. It's probably going to drive you crazy. So baby steps. Baby steps is the best way to get through a lot of this stuff one if and elif statement at a time and test. So now we get an even better one. 
lab 3.13 is very much like that floor uh, sh program I showed you. So here, whoops, I did it again, my bad. So here what we have is somebody's going to input something. And that's going to be a whole number. And it could be anything. We don't want it to be um, zero, less than or zero, less than or equal to zero. So if somebody puts a zero in or a negative number, the first thing we do is we check for validity. And this is an important thing in most programming in general. It will be an important thing in your project. Check for the validity of the input as soon as you can. So in this case, if I've put in a negative number or zero, I'm basically going to say, say sorry, no change, and be done. Um, if that is OK, then I'm going to then calculate the number of times the dollar, number of times 100 appears, and number of times 25 appears, and number of times 10, and number of times 5, and then the rest is the remainder are pennies. So I'm going to do all those calculations. That's fine. Use the floor operator, follow the pattern, and then I get into the if statements. Now these are compound if statements, and they look very strikingly similar to the stuff in floor.py. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say is num dollars greater than zero. If it is, then I'm going to output the number of dollars, and I'm either going to output the word dollar or dollars, and we saw how to do that. The same happens with quarters. Again, it is there are nested if statements in this, um, and this follows a very distinctive pattern. Once you get one to work, it's much easier to get the rest. So again, baby steps. Start out with using the floor operator on dollars, and then write your if statement. And then go back and do the floor operator for quarters, and then write that if statement. And you do that until you're done and the program works. Baby steps is very important. So I think it's time. Sorry I kept you guys over a little bit. OK. Does anybody have any questions? Please feel free to ask and um, take your mics off mute if you um, want to ask anything. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to stop screen sharing and everybody have a good evening. Oh, you have a question about PyCharm. Go ahead. How do you open a new tab? Uh, do you just, for an existing or for um, a new file? Because if you just want to do a new file, you just do new PyCharm file, type in test. Oh, I can't create it because I created it before. File, new, Python file, test one. And it opens the tab automatically for me. And if I want to open a different one, let's say money.py, which looks kind of similar to what you might have to do. Um, probably shouldn't include that. Let's do nested.py. <laughs> you just get more tabs, so just open them. No problem. And the other thing to realize, and people have a problem with this sometimes, when you want to get to the PY file, okay, you want to right click. Hold on. I'm on a Mac, so it's a little different. Here, it will, I will go Reveal in Finder, but in the Windows, I said it might say Open in Directory or something. 
but that's how you figure out where this file is so you can turn it in and it will take you to the directory where the py file is stored so again if you want to know how to get nested.py and you because you need to turn in nested.py you right click and for Mac users it's reveal in finder and I think for PC users it's open in folder or something and it will take you to that exact location so you can then um, upload that to Brightspace no problem does anybody have any other questions going once going twice everybody have a wonderful evening this should be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow hopefully around noon if not it'll be up in the early evening good night everybody